right. Uh, good morning. Uh, we are glad that you are here, uh, that God has brought us together to worship Him. Uh, before we get started, a few announcements. Uh, after the service this morning, there is a business meeting that will happen in this room, so don't go too far. Just come back to your seats, and we'll do our uh, business meeting. Uh, seniors luncheon this Thursday at 1030. It's going to be their Thanksgiving-ish time, so they ask you to bring a side salad and or dessert to share, and they'll provide the rest. Next Sunday, November 19th, is uh, the church-wide Thanksgiving meal. And uh, again, church will be providing the main things, but you can bring a side dish or dessert. So two opportunities this week. Yes, ma'am, Miss Donna. Oh, I misread that, or, or I was in the bulletin wrong. So I'm glad you said that. So just show up, bring your $3. All right, thank you for that correction. Uh, focused ministry event, December 13th. There will be some more details to come. That's a Wednesday night, and uh, there will be an opportunity for the whole church to gather and do a project. Uh, and then December 9th is a women's ministry breakfast. Uh, more details to follow on that. Okay, Nathan is going to come up and uh, give an update on the Associate Minister of Youth and Children Search Committee. Good morning. Um, so yes, I am the spokesperson for the search committee for the, the new youth minister that we're looking for. Um, so I'll, we're going to try to do monthly updates. That way you guys kind of know where, where we're at in the process and stuff like that. Um, so, so far, we've been meeting for three or four weeks now, um, kind of building, building a church profile, trying to figure out um, what kind of person we're looking for and going through some training. Um, the IBSA puts out a great training program um, that we've been going through and has really changed, especially mine, but um, everybody on the team's kind of thought process about what we're doing. I mean, more than just looking for job applicants. I mean, I hired people for businesses and stuff like that. So I thought I'd be good at it, but we're not really hiring a person for a job, right? We're hiring a person who's gonna be a minister. So it needs to be bathed in prayer and seeking God so that God can show us who to bring to the church. And so that's kind of changed my mindset and the mindset of the others on the committee. So we ask that you continue to pray with us as we go forward. Um, one of the things that we're going to work on this evening is kind of a prayer calendar that we'll be sending out to everybody so that you guys kind of can keep us in your prayers, start praying for the future um, youth minister, um, just other things like that. So kind of preparing everybody as we're going through this process. Um, so yeah, kind of where we're at right now is um, in the business meeting this afternoon, we're going to be going over the job description so the church knows who we're, who we're looking for, and then from there we will just post that job and start collecting resumes. So kind of hopefully by the, time we, by the time I announce again, hopefully we'll start be looking at resumes at that point, and uh, yeah, we'll just keep in touch. So keep praying for us, and then we'll be putting out stuff that you guys can specifically pray for as we go forward. So thank you. Uh, Valerie, couldn't find you. Okay, yeah, Valerie's going to come up. After knee surgery, you're very careful with cords. Um, I'd like a, to pray over our Operation Christmas Child boxes that we are going to be delivering uh, to Northwoods next week. And if you do not have your box in yet, I will not deliver them probably till Tuesday, so you have another day to drop them off in the office. Um, and from there, they'll probably go to Aurora to a processing center where they'll put in the gospel tracts and do those various things. So I would like to just pray for these for over these boxes and that you will continue to pray for the boxes that you that you uh, made and put together and for the child that will receive them. So if you'll bow your heads, we'll pray for our boxes. Father, um, we just thank you for every person who was able to put a box together for a specific child that you know who's going to get that box. Father, we thank you that when they open their box, they are going to also hear the gospel. They're going to get a gospel uh, uh, book. They are going to get items that they need and also items that will give them pleasure just because it's special just for them. 
Um, Father, we especially thank you, Lord, that this is an opportunity to share the gospel throughout the world um, that is so desperately needed. I just pray, Lord, that you will uh, work through all of the volunteers and the people who do all of the different steps along the way, that these boxes will get to where they need to be. And we just thank you for all those who have uh, taken the time um, to uh, get a box together and get it here. And thank you that we are able to uh, pay for that processing fee that helps so many people who, who wouldn't be able to do it otherwise. Uh, just lift this up to you and lift these boxes up to you, knowing that you know where they're going and you know the children that are going to receive them and the families that are going to be impacted. We just pray, Lord, that it will all be done to your glory. It's in your name we pray, Lord. Amen. All right, thank you, Valerie. Uh, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? I'll be reading the section from uh, Numbers 21, and then I'll ask you to join me in a moment. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Now in the New Testament, we read together from the book of John. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We look to the sun. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. Save for God. 
Galatians 6, 14, but far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. What wonder of wonders, what love is this, that Christ would die for me. His goodness, His merit, His righteousness, the sinner's only plea. O oh, foolish pride, be crucified, the work is finished. All my boast is in Jesus, all my hope is His love. sacred hill thy praises now return rise up my soul and bless the Lord generations immigrants find their jobs in blue-collar work um, but second and third generation um, are enjoying enjoying dual citizenship between France and Nigeria and, and Algeria and they are integrating French culture and work into their life um, but they still strictly adhere to the Sunni Islamic beliefs that they were raised with 
So let's pray for these people, the Shiwaya group, um, and let's pray John 1.12. But to all who did receive him, all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Lord, whatever, uh, however we were raised, whatever we were raised believing, um, if we receive you, you give us that right. Um, beyond all imagination. <laughs> um, and Lord, I pray that these people in France um, would, would see you and that they would receive that right for themselves. Amen. 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 Please stand as we sing of this, this wonderful, powerful name that can save. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name. Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ. Philippians has this to say about that name. Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so we sing, Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. You have no Yours is a name above all. 
Help us, give us grace to look to you and find all of the rest and resources that we need in you. Uh, we pray that you give us that grace and that wisdom to do that in these moments and tomorrow morning and, and every day this week. Uh, help us, we know that you're with us, so we pray that you would uh, make us aware of that and, and 
Point us to you. May we look to you always. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And children, may be dismissed for kids' worship. Good morning. Uh, as the kids are leaving, let me just mention, most of you are aware, yesterday was Veterans Day, uh, November 11th, um, 1918, uh, at 11 a.m., armistice was declared in World War I, and since that time, November 11th has been known as Veterans Day when we have honored those uh, who have served, so I'd like to do that this morning. If you served in the military... Uh, we would like to show you our appreciation. Would you please stand? Thank you. Thank you very much for your service. We, we really do appreciate it. Uh, if you've got your Bibles today, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 and the need for change on September 3rd 1989 uh, Varig Airlines flight 254 was at the Marabá airport in Brazil and prepared to take off they were taking a short trip it was going to go to the, the city of Belém on the coast about 48 minutes away. The captain that day was Cesar Garces. And he looked at his computer-generated flight plan and he read the number, 0270. That corresponded to the magnetic heading from Maraba to Belém. But Garces, when he put it into the computer, typed in, Two seven zero. He skipped the first number. Minutes later, flight 254 took off, climbed to an altitude of 29,000 feet, and instead of clo uh, heading northeast toward Belém, they began to head directly west toward the Amazon forest. Captain Dar says eventually figured out something's wrong because I should be able to see the airport. I mean, it's a short trip. Only 48 minutes. Frustrated, he just turned the plane around. 180 degrees. Which, of course, makes no sense because he didn't know where he was in the first place. By that time, the flight attendants were hearing for the passengers, and they're saying, shouldn't we be seeing the airport? Shouldn't we be in, getting close to landing by now? And so Gar says, just lied. He announced that there was a power failure at the Belém airport, and we're just going to circle the area until they have restored power. Despite not knowing where he was, Captain Garces informed the flight coordinators on the ground of his own airline, yeah, we should be landing in about five minutes. He then ordered the flight attendants to serve a fresh round of drink for all the confused passengers. By 7.39 p.m., the flight was 68 minutes overdue. And the first officer began to look at everything, and he saw what the problem was. He could tell exactly what had happened and the mistake that the captain had made. But the captain refused to listen to him and refused to ask for help. And he began to look at the dials and he began to count the minutes until he knew they were going to be running out of fuel. All the while, he's looking around, hoping to see an airport somewhere big enough so he can land this plane. About an hour later, they ran out of fuel. Captain Garces made a remarkable crash landing in total darkness in a dense tropical forest. The plane was 700 miles from where it was supposed to be. All six of the crew survived, but 13 of the 48 passengers were killed. 
both Captain Garcez and the first officer lost their commercial licenses and they never flew again. Sometimes if we refuse to change, it can be disastrous. Now, it may not cost somebody their life, but it may cost a relationship. It may cost somebody their career. Refusal to allow change to come can bring about our own spiritual death. How do we change from who we are to who we're supposed to be? How do we change from who we are to who God designed us to be? How do we change from who we are to who we could be? One day on his journey to Jerusalem, Jesus met a man who desperately needed to change. And this story is about one of those people you just think, well, he'll never change. He could never change. But then he does. So let's read about it in Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore, sycamore big tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. First of all, we're going to see here that Zacchaeus was rich, but he was not content. Zacchaeus was famous around the little city of Jericho. He was known for three things. He was short, he was rich, he was a tax collector. Frederick Buechner, when he wrote about this passage, described Zacchaeus as a sawed-off social disaster, meaning he was short, he was hated. He was hated because he was collaborating with the Romans. He was hated, hated because he, he handled filthy Gentile money and he was hated because he was filthy rich most of all Zacchaeus was notorious for being a tax collector pretty much everybody hated the tax collectors because they were working for the Romans they didn't have to do that you didn't have to take that job but the Roman government would hire these people and they, they would allow them to keep everything they wanted to above what they had to collect. It would be like this. If I'm the tax collector and I come to you and I know that you owe the Roman government $5, I'm going to charge you 10 And I get to keep the other 5 They were notorious for putting extremely heavy burdens on people who had very little in the first place. And they made themselves rich off of these poor people. They would send people to debtors' prisons. They would let families go hungry. And they could not care less about what anybody thought. Tax collectors tended to become pretty wealthy. They could afford really nice homes. They usually had servants. They could enjoy luxuries that were not available to the average person. And Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. He's in working in a system that apparently works sort of like a, a pyramid sales scheme. And he was at the top of a very profitable money-making machine. He was a very wealthy man. 
just about everybody would welcome wealth. But money does not buy happiness. It certainly didn't seem to do so for Zacchaeus. He had accumulated his wealth by serving the invaders of his own country at the expense of his own countrymen. Zacchaeus, whose name means the pure one or the righteous one, was neither one of those. And the mention of his name probably stirred up disgust for a lot of people. Money was probably nice. Zacchaeus probably enjoyed it. But to live as an outcast among your own people just had to be a sad existence. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector and was wealthy, but he was not content. Contentment is a peace that we have on the inside. It's a satisfaction with whatever you have. And he knew that there was more to life than what he was experiencing from day to day. And my guess is, if you are content, then you know it. And if you're not content, you want it. We all desire, I think we all desire to be satisfied with whatever we have, whether it is sickness or health, life or death, lots of money or little money, a big house or a small house, old car, new car, whatever. We envy those people who are happy no matter what they've got. Zacchaeus wanted more. So when he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was in town, he said, I'm going to check this out for myself. And that's the second thing we see here, is Zacchaeus did whatever was necessary, whatever was necessary to see Jesus. Look at verse 3. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. You know, it might have been a risk for Zacchaeus to ever get out in a crowd. Just about everybody would know who he is. I mean, Jericho was not a very large city. It's still not today. So probably everybody knew the chief tax collector of Jericho. And there was no shortage of folks. If they were out in a crowd, there would be no shortage of people who would like to slip up and maybe kick him in the shins when he couldn't see who it was. Or shove him from behind. Or maybe even put a knife in his back. He could be trampled to death by a crowd. And they couldn't say there was any one particular person who's responsible for it. So I just wonder, I don't know, but I wonder if he avoided crowds for any of these reasons or all of these reasons. But he was desperate to see Jesus. And Zacchaeus was willing to do whatever it took. So verse 4 says, So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. He thought it through. He planned ahead. And the tree he chose, and this is a sycamore fig tree, and that picture is actually taken in Jericho. I've stood in front of that tree. And I looked at the pictures I'd taken. They weren't that good. So I got one somebody else had taken. But I can't say that's the tree that Zacchaeus was in. But that's probably what it would have looked like, something like that. And he knew this tree was going to be large enough. It got enough branches. He could climb up. And he can even hide in it. I mean, you can hide pretty well with that many leaves. So he sort of calculated Jesus' journey. And he was going to be waiting for him as Jesus came down the road. This man who was despised for his occupation, probably mocked for his height, envied for his wealth, had inside of him this overwhelming desire to see Jesus. And he was willing to do anything to connect with Jesus. And there are plenty of people out there who want to make that kind of connection. I read recently about 
a group of young Muslim Indonesians. And they were baptized in an outdoor public pool to show the world that they are connected to Jesus because they have a desire to connect to Jesus. And they were baptized in this outdoor pool in one of the most fanatically Muslim cities in Indonesia. For them, it could have meant risking the loss of their job, maybe the loss of their family, maybe even the loss of their life. But like Zacchaeus, they're willing to do whatever it takes to have that connection with Jesus Christ. And that's the way I want to be. I want to be filled with that kind of passion to always have that kind of connection with Jesus Christ. Filled with a passion to know him. And it's the way I'd like for all of us to be. Seeking Jesus, desiring him more than anything anything else in this world. Desiring him more than wealth, more than personal safety, and knowing that the only true satisfaction, the only real contentment we're going to find in this life is going to be found in Jesus Christ. There is no other place. Third thing that happens. Jesus saw Zacchaeus and recognized who he could become. Look at verses 5 and 6. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and saw Zacchaeus. Excuse me. He looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. It sounds as though Jesus knew he was going to be there. Why else would you look up, look up into a tree to find a man? How did Jesus know his name? How did Jesus know exactly what to say? Something amazing was going on here that day. Zacchaeus thought he was seeking Jesus. The truth is, Jesus was seeking Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus wanted to see Jesus, but Jesus wanted to see him. Zacchaeus wanted to meet Jesus, but Jesus already knew who Zacchaeus was. Who was seeking whom? It was Zacchaeus seeking Jesus, right? It was Zacchaeus who was running ahead of the crowd so he could see who Jesus was. He's, He's climbing up into that sycamore fig tree all the actions it's all Zacchaeus it's all about him trying to see Jesus but by the end of the story it's Jesus who says the son of man came to seek out and to save the lost yeah Zacchaeus went to some trouble to see Jesus but Jesus went to a lot more trouble to see Zacchaeus Their meeting never would have happened if Jesus was not making his way to Jerusalem. I mean, Jericho's the last stop before they get to Jerusalem and before Jesus faces the cross. That's what's going on here. Jesus is going to Jerusalem to die. And this is the last stop before you get there. And once Jesus made it to Jericho, Jesus took the trouble to see who in the world is up there in that tree. And Jesus took the trouble to offer to come to Zacchaeus' house. And it was really trouble because the attention that Jesus gave Zacchaeus offended a whole lot of people. Jesus was actually offering to go to Zacchaeus' house to eat with someone who's religiously unclean. to make a relationship with someone who's extremely unpopular in this town. He was wanting to treat Zacchaeus like family. That's what you do when you go to their house to eat. And his offer was a lot more than a lot of people could stand. And as far as they were concerned, when Jesus included the tax collector, he lost all credibility. So you see all the trouble that Jesus went to and all the trouble that Jesus got into to find Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus may have thought it was he seeking Jesus, 
But he found out that Jesus had been seeking him the whole time. Isn't that the tr way it always is? That's the way it always is. Wasn't that way when Jesus found you? I mean, we, we recognize that there's an emptiness within us. We recognize that there's a void in our life. And we begin to search for something to fill that void. And when Jesus did come into your life, didn't you finally figure out he's been looking for me the whole time? He's been looking for me. That's why I had this emptiness. That's why I had the void. That's why I had to be searching. It's because Jesus was looking for me. It wasn't you that found Jesus. It was Jesus that found you. I mean, that was my story. Before I was, at, I was even born, Jesus was at work with my family. Before I was old enough to begin seeking Jesus, he was reaching out to my mother and my father. Hollis Kitchens was the pastor of First Baptist Church, Anderson, Alabama, in the late 1950s. And several years before I was even born, he would go into my daddy's barbershop on a regular basis, and he began to have an influence on my dad. I was six years old when I saw both my parents baptized. And three years later, I followed them into the same baptistry, professing my faith in Christ. But Jesus had been at work a long time before any of that. Before I went to college, Christ was at work there in the life of a campus minister named Jim Warren, who today is still one of the best mentors I've had in my life. There was a group there called the Baptist Student Union, called it Baptist Campus Ministries today. And so by the time I got to college, by the time I began to try to, to seek Jesus, to piece together, what am I going to do with my life? What am I going to do with the rest of my life? Jesus was already there, working in people who would befriend me, who would influence me. He had a direction for me. At every turn of my life, Jesus Christ was seeking me out. And I'll bet that's been true of you too. I know it was that way between Zacchaeus and Jesus. It's exactly what was going on. And when Jesus saw Zacchaeus, he didn't look up there and just see some short guy. He looked up to see this man created in the image of God. And when Jesus looked at Zacchaeus, he didn't see a, a greedy thief. He saw a man who could be filled with compassion and generosity. When Jesus looked at Zacchaeus, he didn't see a man to hate. He saw someone to love. He didn't see Zacchaeus for who he'd been all these years. He saw Zacchaeus for who he could become, how God could change him. That's the way Jesus sees us. Society may label us with any kind of description that we hate or the physical characteristics that we have on the outside or the, or the history of past behaviors that we regret. But Jesus sees something different. He sees the best where others see the worst. He sees all he wants us to be and all he wants us to do. He sees who we were created to be, who God made us to be. I would like to tell you that today, all you got to do is see yourself the way Jesus sees you. But that's not easy to do. Because we're all sinners and we see our own sin and we see how we've messed up our own lives. But Jesus has hopes he has promises for each of us beyond what we can even imagine. Like Zacchaeus, we need to listen to what he says. We need to, to come down from wherever we're hiding. And we need to go do whatever he tells us to go do. Only then will we be able to fulfill those incredible dreams that God has for every single one of us. The last thing here is 
Zacchaeus welcomed Jesus, and Jesus changed Zacchaeus. When Jesus asked to come into Zacchaeus' life and home, the tax collector of Jericho, the chief tax collector, said yes, and he welcomed Jesus into his house. He said he welcomed him gladly. Now the people didn't see what Jesus saw because the Bible says all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. That disgusting Zacchaeus. They could not imagine that Zacchaeus could ever be anything other than what he's been all these years as a chief tax collector. But a total transformation began to take place in the life of this man. Look at verses 8 through 10. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. Now we don't know exactly what happened at the house of Zacchaeus. We don't know about their conversation. We don't know what he talked about. We don't know what they ate. We don't know any of those things. All we see are the results, and the results tell us everything. Zacchaeus makes a two-part pledge. He says, half of everything that I own right now, I will give to the poor. He says, if I've cheated anybody, that's a big if. You know he's cheated people because he's working for the Romans. He's a tax collector. If I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay them back four times the amount. The law said, If you're making restitution to somebody, you pay them back what you took plus 20%. Zacchaeus thought 400% interest was more appropriate. 400%. Something in that meeting, in that encounter with Jesus Christ changed Zacchaeus. And the way he saw the world, and the way he saw life, and the way he understood priorities. He could see now people in need instead of people that he was just waiting to fleece. Isn't that one of the more dangerous things that Jesus does to us? He changes our eyes, he changes the way we see people. Labels don't work anymore. Rich, poor, Democrat, Republican, black, white. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. Now we see people who are just as needy as we are. People created in the image of God who have sinned and damaged themselves by their own sin and in need of the grace of God. Now we see people with real needs. We get a glimpse of this every time there's a disaster. There's a hurricane, there's a tornado, a plane falls from the sky. People rally to the support of their neighbors, to their community, and it doesn't make any difference whether they're rich or poor. It doesn't make any difference the color of their skin. People will rally together, and that will happen for just a little while. And then we'll go back to who we always are. But salvation comes to Zacchaeus' house, and he is forever changed. He's no longer a taker. He's now a giver. This man had made his living taking from others, and now after one meal with Jesus, he's like the United Way of Jericho. He's giving money away right and left. As a pastor, I've seen this happen. There was a woman I led to Christ. She was divorced. She'd recently gone through really hard times with that divorce. And I sat down with her, and she prayed to receive Christ. A dramatic thing happened in her life. And then two weeks later, she said, Now, how do I go about giving to the church? Nobody was talking to her about tithing, nobody had talked to her about giving. But God had changed her heart. And when Christ takes up residence in a life, we become generous. 
Somehow he loosens our grip on our wallet, on our pocketbook, on our credit card. And giving becomes an opportunity, not a requirement. And that's exactly what happens in the life of Zacchaeus. He became a generous man. Zacchaeus became content. Zacchaeus became a Christian. He was changed from the inside out by Christ himself. I would like to explain to you step by step exactly how that happened, but it's mysterious. It's supernatural. God's Spirit does it, and we can't put our finger on it because He's doing it. Life can be different, change is possible. And it's hard to just give somebody a pat little answer because God does it. And you can't explain what God does. All I know is that Zacchaeus did it for Zacchaeus. Excuse me, that Jesus did it for Zacchaeus. And that Jesus still does it for people. He still changes us. Jesus explained himself this way. The Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. The word lost refers to something that's been put in the wrong place. To save is to put whatever that is in the right place. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to put Zacchaeus in the right place. He came to take me and you and take us from that wrong place and put us in the right place. And how did he do that? Jesus came and he lived a perfect, blameless life. He died on the cross to pay for my sins and to pay for your sins. He was buried, and on the third day, he was raised from the dead. And as he's raised from the dead, he can raise every single one of us to new life, to change, to transformation. So when he asks, can I come into your life? Can I take over your life? Say yes. Do what he wants you to do. Go where he wants you to go. Don't hold job tight to, to a job or to money or opinions that others have about you. Just put total trust in Jesus Christ. Total trust. And he'll change you into the person that you were created to be, that God designed you to be. Let's pray together. Father, we know that even now your spirit is working among us and that you want to change us into the people that you created us to be, designed us to be, to live as your children, to live in your kingdom, to experience your forgiveness, your salvation, your grace, your transformation. Help us now to give ourselves to you. As you're seeking us, because we know that's where it begins, Help us to seek you and to know you and to have a passion to be with you every single day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be singing our benediction. I'm going to be here to pray with you. Joe is going to be up here to pray. Shelly will be here. The three of us will be right here if we can pray with you. If God's Spirit has spoken to you about what Jesus Christ wants to do in your life, and we can pray with you about that. We invite you to come. Let's stand and sing. And you come as God's Spirit leads you. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood shed for me and that thou bidst me come to thee O Lamb of God I come I come just as I am
soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can cleanse each part O Lamb of God I come I come I come be mended, I come wounded to be healed, I come desperate to be rescued, I come empty to be filled, I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb, and I'm Just as I am, I would be lost, but mercy and grace my freedom bought, and now to glory in your cross, so I come broken to be mended, I come wounded to be healed, I come desperate to be rescued, I come empty to be filled, I come guilty to be pardoned by the I come broken to be mended, I come wounded to be healed, I come desperate to be rescued, I come empty to be filled, I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb, and I'm as I am. Praise God just as